So who here loves statistics? Applause, hands. Yes. OK, about half the room seems about right, 50%. The rest of you must hate it, because it, from, from my experience, there seems to be no middle ground with the two. Um, but if you love it, I think you've come to the right talk. If you don't, hopefully I can swing your opinion a little more towards liking it. So uh, like you said, my name is Corey Christensen. I graduated from Utah State University recently in a Bachelor's of Statistics where I focused on machine learning. And in my studies, I came to learn that statistics becomes far more powerful with programming. And in machine learning, it is basically essential. So I earned my minor in computer science and participated in a club called Hack USU. And then soon after, I was hired at Atomic Jolt, where I've been working for the past two years, uh, learning JavaScript and Ruby on Rails. And well, here we go. So why data visualization? And that's to say, why am I giving a talk about data visualization and why is it important? I think the answers to these questions are fairly conspicuous, but I believe it is important to review the basics of everything we do from time to time, including visualizing our data. My goal today is to go over those basics and to give you all tools to aid you in your charts and graphs. Now, before I go on, it is worth noting that I love terrible visualizations. Does anybody else love terrible visualizations? We've got a man up front, awesome. <laughs> I think they can be hilarious, um, and they're not, they're not hard to find. Uh, just watch any major news source, like <laughs> Fox News, um, and you'll see. But uh, however, it's not always apparent that a specific visualization is uh, not ideal. By looking through bad visualizations, I learn how I can improve my own. And so when you look through some visualized data, ask yourself, uh, what is good about this visualization? What is bad and how can it be improved? Uh, now today we're gonna have some fun and let's look through some of my favorite terrible visualizations. Now before I go into these, uh, I'll ask who can tell me what's wrong with these? Um, just feel free to shout out your answers as they come to you. So this is our first. Here we go. I think, <laughs> as anybody spotted, I, I'm hearing some laughter, so I'm guessing that uh, it's, it's pretty apparent. The, uh, the colors are completely backwards, and I think a better question is what isn't wrong with this visualization? These are, these are real charts that people have put out, and um, I'm not sure if I can find a positive for this, except for I, I do think they got this more funny, right? I think this one's pretty funny. All right, here's next. Can anybody spot and shout out what, what's wrong with this chart? This comes out of a history textbook. A little less obvious, but if you haven't noticed, the, uh, the dates at the bottom are a little, a little off there. It says 1960 to 1980, but then they proceed to go from 1960 to 1950, and then jump to 1970. Makes complete sense. Oh, and then after 1980, let's just keep going, because why not? Anybody spot this? It might take a little bit of reading. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure why anyone would really care how many bananas somebody else eats, but now you know Johan Blake eats eight two bananas. <laughs> All right, before I go on to the next one, I gotta ask, how many people here are dog people? Yeah, dog people, mostly up front, and then the cat people? Anybody, anybody else for not dogs or cats? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Animal haters here. All right, well, if you're a dog person or, or a cat person, you're gonna love, love this chart. Um, <laughs> somebody decided to uh, visualize which country likes dogs more and which likes cats more in Europe for all the data they got, and then put a picture of each of them there. Now, the idea is pretty cool but I think it'd be more useful to show percentages. Although some of these pictures are pretty darn cute. So uh, we see there's a lot of bad representations in, uh, of data out there in the world. And uh, we, we know there's going to be more. Um, the International Data Corporation estimates that there will be 
163 zettabytes of data. Now that's one sextillion by, uh, bytes. So if you're wondering how many zeros that is, I, I did the math for you. So it's a big number. So what I want to get across to you is with so much data available, it is our responsibility to procure information as clear and as accurate as possible. So first, we need to manage our data. What do I mean? Uh, to illustrate, let's look at another bad graph. This is the results from a poll. What game do you play most on the Nintendo Switch earlier this year? <laughs> I see some of you responded the problem already. Um, <laughs> it appears that there's about 37 different answers, and I, I did count. <laughs> uh, curious, has anybody here played Breath of the Wild? It's a good game. Yeah, okay. I, I need to get on that one. That, that sounds like fun. But uh, the lesson in this is clear. Uh, sanitize your data. Uh, we need to manage how our data comes in to our applications. For example, a, a text box was probably not the correct way to get the user's input for the Nintendo Switch poll. Rather, a drop down or some radio buttons would have gone a long way in sanitizing that data. We, uh, we also want to manage how it's processed. Say it's too late and your data is as messy as, as that, uh, then there, there are tools out there to uh, help with sanitizing the data. One I've worked with personally and recommend looking into is called OpenRefine. You can go to openrefine.org to find that tool. It's, it's very, very useful. When we visualize data, we are telling a story with the data. Because each data set has a story to tell, we need to take care of how to portray it correctly. Be careful not to confuse the data story with your own. Here's an example of where that confusion may be evident. This was posted to Reddit about a week and a half ago under the r slash data is beautiful subreddit. And for those who are curious, a lot of these Bad visualizations I get come from the r slash data is ugly subreddit. It's fantastic. Um, now, at first glance, this story is, uh, seems to be this. Over time, internet searches for common storage terms, megabyte, gigabyte, and terabyte, have decreased over time, while the term cloud has increased, and as a result of cloud storage gaining interest, the graph is clearly showing a correlation between the two. But, but in reality, this isn't the story at all. Here's what the user who posted it said. This is a comparison of interest in these terms separately, not the volume of searches for these terms relative to each other. The blue line above the green line does not imply that more were searching for cloud at that date. It just states that out of all the interest in the term cloud versus all the interest in storage terms. At the date, cloud was at Y1 in its lifetime interest, and storage terms were at Y2 in their lifetime interest. And Y1 was greater than Y2, nothing more. Therefore, the date of the crossover, May 2009, is mostly meaningless and will adjust over time, but I labeled it anyways. These are two separate graphs displaying search interests laid on top of each other and have no direct weights relative to each other. <laughs> so I believe there's a couple lessons we can learn from this. First, don't tell a story that isn't there. Uh, if these two trends don't have a correlation with each other, why would you draw this chart at all? Uh, second, don't add information that isn't relevant to the story. Adding in the date of the crossover, May 2009, was just unnecessary and, yeah, just foolish. Before I move on, one last thing to note. Cloud isn't always a storage term. It's entirely possible that the interest of clouds themselves have grown over time. <laughs> so I think this search term could have been a little more specific. <laughs> now, I've shown enough bad examples for now. Uh, let's go over what I think is a fantastic storytelling with data. Um, this website is used to show how machine learning works. It uses a data set based on housing in New York City and in San Francisco. Using the attributes of the data, the story explains step by step how this data can be used for classification. So let's take a look at it. You'll see that uh, as I scroll through this, it'll show you how the data transforms and they can pull things out. So here is uh, elevations of housing, I believe. Uh, the green being San Francisco and the, B, uh, the blue being New York, the beginning of our story. 
And then they classify based off of another attribute, correct? If you keep scrolling, <coughs> you'll see different scatter plots representing different attributes and how they rate, relate to each other. And here, they're gonna start building a tree off of the data. This is my favorite piece right here. Boom, ba doom, ba doom, ba doom, ba doom. Right? So these are a tree of different attributes that can be classified as housing in San Francisco or housing in New York. So then they run through a test set, I mean a training set, and then the test set to get your correct visualization, uh, your correct test accuracy of 89.7%. And I think that is a great way of telling a story, right? You see how it runs through each step of machine learning and how it can be done very well. All right, one word of caution. Autodesk Research recently released an article about what they call the data source dozen. Here is a scatter plot of a dinosaur. And to the right, you will see some summary statistics of that data. Now, what is interesting is that each of these 12 plots share the exact same summary statistics to two decimal places. Although they tell a completely different story, you see we have a dinosaur, we have a star, we have circles, we have an X, right? And so in your visualizations, be sure you understand the data so you can correctly tell the story. Um, don't tell the story of a data dinosaur when your, story, uh, when your data tells the story of a star. All right. Now we know the importance of choosing the right way to visualize your data, let's go over some best practices for different chart types. But first, let's have some more fun with bad graphs, because I love them. <laughs> All right, here's a comparison of two graphics cards. Has anybody spotted the issue yet? The two bars have only one unit of difference, with 68 and 69. Um, <laughs> Now, yeah, Intel might be a, a better graphics card in this case, but uh, it's, it's a deceptive visualization. Uh, they, should have, uh, they should have started at, at zero to, to show the actual difference. I've been told this comes up when you install the Microsoft Edge browser. Uh, but it has a similar problem to the last chart. It, it doesn't start at zero, it starts at 25,000. <laughs> And not to mention that we don't know what the units are. It's 30,818 of something. Uh, for all we know, it could be measured in negative kilobytes per second. <laughs> but, but I kid. Um, so, whoops. In general, uh, we need to keep these in mind for all our visualizations. You should start your y-axis at zero. Uh, also, try to maximize the information you display while keeping the story of the data clear. There's a fine balance between displaying information and confusing the user. Don't duplicate information. Also, when you visualize with scale, such as in bubble charts, scale with the area and not the diameter, so not to be deceptive to the user. Also, when choosing which chart type to use, consider which type of data you're using. Uh, data can be discrete or continuous. Discrete data is the type of data that you can count. And a discrete variable has a limited number of values of, that it can take on, like the number of planets around a star. On the other hand, continuous data can take on infinite values, like temperatures. So let's look at some more bad graphs. What a mess. I love how much data is stuffed into this. This circle is supposed to be a clock showing which times of activities are most popular during the day. And it's not just any clock, it's a 24-hour clock instead of the 12 we're used to. So, I'll read the explanation here. Each activity is a line hitting the circle at the peak time of popularity. The length of the line to the left of this point is the proportion of time spent before noon, while the line to the right is the proportion spent from noon until midnight. The angle of the line is the linear regression slope of each activity's popularity <laughs> between 2003 and 2015. Did you understand what that was trying to say? I still don't. Um, it's, it's a cool idea, but it, uh, just uh, don't do that. <laughs> Here's another. This one's actually pretty cool looking. Um, it's the top 100 sites of the internet. But here's the problem. Can anybody find site number 15? I'll give you a few seconds. And I promise it's there. 
See, this is a chart that definitely maximized the information, but it probably could have simplified things a little to help us understand the data better. Craigslist, Craigslist number 15, he found it. Excellent. All right. Now let's go some, over, uh, some specifics for a few chart types. First, we have bar and column charts. This is what they look like. Ta-da. Use consistent colors throughout bar charts, selecting accent colors to highlight meaningful data points or changes over time. Use horizontal labels to improve readability. Start the y-axis at zero, again, to appropriately reflect the values in your graph. These are good for visualizing discrete data. Make the chart scale large enough to view the group sizes in relation one to each other. And what I mean by that is you don't want to have one bar that's really tall and another one that's really, really squished so that the user can't exactly discern how, how big of a value that truly is. Next, we have line charts. This is a line chart. These are good for visualizing continuous data. When you're doing line charts, you should usually just use solid lines only. Uh, and don't plot more than fall, uh, four lines to avoid visual distractions. If you haven't had enough bad examples of visual distractions yet, let me illustrate why we avoid more than four lines. You can see how this is kind of a roller coaster for your eyes. It reminds me of the kids' toys you find in the doctor's office. <laughs> Next is area charts. They are similar to line charts, but emphasize the area underneath. They are, good, they are also good for visualizing continuous data, like line charts, and they use, transpa use transparent colors so information isn't obscured in the background, such as grid lines. Uh, don't display more than four categories to avoid clutter as well. Now, let's go over scatter plots. For my example, I thought I'd bring back our favorite dinosaurs, a uh, datasaurus. These are also good for visualizing continuous data. Again, start the y-axis at zero, I repeat these because it's actually like a big deal. <laughs> and use, if you use trend lines to kind of show uh, you know, the user how the data is, uh, is distributed, use a maximum of two just so you make the plot easy to understand and not so cluttered. Next is histograms. They're a specialized type of bar chart. They're good for visualizing a distribution of data. Um, ranges of the data are combined into bins, so each bar represents a range of data. And the bin ranges should be narrow enough to show the distribution correctly, but wide enough to reduce the noise and the error that comes from having data. Next is one of my favorites, heat maps. They're really excellent for visualizing three dimensions of data. And here, the interesting point would be this light point over here. Um, they're good for visualizing continuous data on a scale from one point to another. Use a one or two color gradient to show the high and low points of your attributes. They're useful for visualizing geographical data such as election data. Now, this is, a, this is something I'd like to spend some time and have some fun with. They're pie charts. This is an example of a donut chart wrapped around a pie chart. I really don't know what these points in the center are supposed to be, but it must mean something. They're, they're good for visualizing discrete data, but don't illustrate too many categories to in ensure differentiation between slices. Ensure that each slice uh, values, all of them add up to 100%, and only compare two or three, otherwise, order the slices according to their size so a user can see how they're different. As a side note, we are really bad at comparing angles, and so pie charts are rarely the right choice for visualizing your data. Now, I have a theory, and I, I have about, what, 100 people right in front of me? So uh, I've set up an app to do what we're going to try a live experiment, and I've even registered a domain for it, piechartsuck.com. <laughs> All right, so basically how this is going to go is this, this app compares the mean difference and estimates for bar and pie charts. It runs a dependent t-test to see if there's a significant difference between the two. 
If the p-value is less than 0 0.05, we can say that there is a significant difference, right? If the pie charts just have awful guesses, bad enough, then my theory will be correct in that we are bad at visualizing pie charts. So what I'd like to do is have everybody go through this, if you want to participate. If you don't, then this might be a boring 10 minutes for you or so. Um, what it's going to show is uh, it should show a bar chart and a pie chart in order for you, right? It'll have a text box for you to input the, your guess of what the percentage is. Um, and so just enter it in as an integer value, don't add a percent where you, I, this is a very rudimentary app that I kind of threw together. And all right, let me set this up for you guys. You want to guess on the you'll be wanting to guess the blue area for the bar chart and the red area for the pie. So any of you that are on the page already can refresh and you should be able to see this on mobile. Uh, for those of you who have 4G data, that will be nice. So in this case, I would probably guess 11 and then hit next. And if all goes well, we'll, ha we'll have some fun with that. So go ahead. So uh, I hear legends of you know live coding during a presentation and I wonder how uh, the nervousness of live coding compares to doing a live experiment. <laughs> if this p-value is really high, I'm going to be super embarrassed. <laughs> but congratulations to all of you for guessing really well on pie charts. <laughs> we'll just pretend that you're just superhumans because you do programming, and the rest of the population is bad at guessing. Is anybody still running? Do we finish? Okay, let's see how we did, huh? Crossing my fingers for this. Oh, what happened? Experiment number seven, you failed me. I even tested this last night, what happened? Well, I could pull up a console and we could run through the calculations, or I could post this later. <laughs> so, console, everybody wants to, let's, we haven't had enough live coding, let's do more. <laughs> All right, let's debug this problem. I've got some time anyway, let's do this. All right. How embarrassing, right? All right, so I've got this host on Heroku. Hope maybe somebody hacked my app and just ruined everything. We'll find out. Let's pull up the calculations because I don't have them memorized. This portion, the calculations have all been done in Ruby and use packages as such. So Heroku run Rails C. So let's pull up. We were experiment number seven, correct? So here's my experiment model. See, this would have been really useful if I did it in a programming language such as like R or Python where they have packages that do everything for you, but I did it by hand. All right, experiment dot find seven. Okay. So we, we did close the experiment. Let's see what the error is, huh? if I could spell. Oh, goodness. 56. Observed value minus true value. It must not have picked up somebody's value there. All right. Yeah, somebody put a decimal or something. It could have, could have done something. You ruined my experiment. How dare you? <laughs> All right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sanitize my data. 
but I'm not going to do that right now because that would take too long. So during the conference, I'll see if I can find the, the problem child in this data, and then I will post a screenshot to the Slack channel, and we'll see what the results were, okay? So results to come, but I thank you all for participating, and that is super embarrassing, so thanks for bearing with me. You broke my app. <laughs> I did say it was rudimentary. I follow my own principles. What a hypocrite. OK. All right, so before I move on to the next section, can anybody tell me immediately? Oh, wait, well, but first, before we move on to the next section, let's, let's go over some tools for picking charts, right? How many in here use React? Can I get a show of hands? OK, most of the people in this room use React. So do I. And so if you're doing some simple charting, um, actually, I'm going to. Pull that back up here. Where is? I use what's called ReCharts. This is an open source library for doing some charting. And it does the basics, but it does it really, really well. Um, a lot of those examples you saw me post in my slides uh, were built off of the examples here in ReCharts. Uh, if I pull up the API, you can see they do area charts, the bar charts, line chart, composed, pi and so forth. So uh, if you do use React, I, I do believe this is a really, really nice tool. It is kept up to date, and so that's, that's what I do prefer. If you, uh, if you don't use React or you want to make something even fancier, of course, uh, D3 is the way to go. So you have several examples of how to visualize data, and I think it's really, really, really good for telling a story, such as, let's just pull up an example, a bivariate hex bin map. Very, very, very cool. So. If you, ha if, if you put in the time worth, uh, to learn D3, I think it'll be, it'll be worth your time and help your visualizations an incredible, incredible amount. So, OK, back to the slides. Where are they after my debugging stuff? OK, now like I was saying, before I move on to the next portion, can anyone quickly tell me what is wrong with this graph? Somebody should know immediately. <laughs> Colors, right. Um, this is, uh, this red and green does not do bode well for those who are colorblind. Um, and, and if you thought pie chart in your head, yeah, you're right, but, you know, that's not the point of this section. Um, so that's right, colorblindness, we need to account for that in our charts. Um, now here's another chart, and like I asked, where are your eyes drawn to, right? The green, that's the one that pops out the most, as well as the blue, right? If you're showing this to a user, the gray isn't going to be as obvious, right? And so um, choosing colors is going to, to go a long way. Um, what's important is to keep in mind how the color hues will affect our users uh, seeing our data. In this chart, whatever the gray represents uh, will not receive the full attention of the user, even though it's the largest section of this chart. Um, so I'd like to show you some, some other tools to help with the color selection. Uh, so I'll pull this up over here. This is a color hexa. Uh, I really like going this for selecting, uh, you know, any color really. So if you hit the search button, it'll pull up data about that color. But not only that, it'll give you some nice color schemes that work well for users. And uh, my favorite part is at the bottom, this is how it looks to those who are colorblind. So you can match the colors and see, oh, this is what a colorblind user is actually seeing when they view my charts. Uh, the other, the, the second tool I'd like to show you is the Color Brewer project. Uh, what I like about this site is that it not only shows data about the color, I mean, sorry, um, this, uh, this project was made to prevent colors from that popping effect that you saw with the green and the blue. Uh, so the data isn't displayed in a biased way. So you can, uh, you can like select, okay, we're going to do qualitative. And you can see that these three colors are even on your eyes, right? None of them actually stand out a whole lot to you. And so uh, you, can even, uh, you can even see down here if the color scheme you've chosen is actually colorblind friendly, right? This one. It, should have a hover three class. It's possibly not colorblind friendly, but say we were to pick oh, this one. It is colorblind friendly, as well as uh, it'll show you if it's photocopy friendly, if it's LCD friendly, and if it's print friendly. So it's, it's very useful for, your, for picking your color schemes. Uh, 
And I, I like to use this when, when using my charts, just to make sure my users view the data appropriately. But as a side note, sometimes you do want the user to be drawn to a certain piece of data. So uh, feel free to make colors pop out to show that difference, right? Such as if, say, you were comparing your product versus other products, right? You might want to make your product stand out and say, oh, look, look how much better our product is compared to our competitors. So. Uh, in conclusion, uh, be sure to manage your data. Make sure the data is sanitized. If you manage how the data is acquired, do so in a way to prevent your data from getting messy. Tell your data's story. Choose carefully how to visualize your data. Make sure it comes across clearly and simply while maximizing the information put forward. Account for those that are colorblind. Think about how your users will perceive your data. And always remember, um, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank Utah JS for giving me this opportunity to present to you today, uh, even though we had a fail. <laughs> uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll be sure to post the results later with that p-value. I'm really curious to see how you all did. We'll, we'll find out what's wrong with that data and get that to you. But uh, thank you all for having me, and that's, that's all. So.